Hello once again. I've got some pretty cool stuff to show you in today's video. This is my Epson Apex Plus Turbo XT computer from 1988. I've made a video about this computer previously and uh, I would recommend that you watch it if you haven't before you watch this video. In that video I introduced this computer, showed all the hardware in it, uh, demonstrated some software in it, and I got some I got requests from a few people to do another video in the future showing more software running on this computer and sort of what this computer can do push to its limits because this computer is upgraded quite heavily. So in today's video, I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be demonstrating yet more software running on this computer, but in particular, I'm going to be showing software taking advantage of a recent upgrade I made to this computer. And it's a big upgrade. This computer has a sound card in it now. I put a sound card in it recently. It's a fully functional Sound Blaster Pro compatible card. Not a real Sound Blaster Pro, but it's a card that is compatible with the Sound Blaster Pro. So as far as the end software is concerned, it just sees a Sound Blaster Pro. So that's a really recent upgrade that I did to this thing just a week or two ago. And uh, in a moment, I'll open this thing up, show you what exactly the sound card is. And in this video, we're going to be, I'm going to demonstrate a whole bunch of software that takes advantage of that sound card. And I'm pretty excited to show you guys that. So yeah, I have a few programs lined up for that and a few other miscellaneous pieces of software that I'll demonstrate. And uh, that'll be the bulk of today's video. Um, just to recap what this is, if you don't recall from the first video or you haven't watched the first video. This computer originally belonged to my high school math teacher. He bought it new and as far as I can tell he used it as his main computer until around 1997. So the original life of this computer was a very long one indeed which is quite impressive. Sometime between 1997 and 2008 which is when I started high school he moved it into his classroom for students to use. And of course, when I started high school in 2008, I remember seeing this thing for the first time. Well, I don't remember anymore because it's, it's been over 10 years. But uh, <laughs> if I had to guess, I would have been quite shocked when I looked in the corner of the big room and there was this, this obviously very old computer next to the modern computers that were in the room. Complete with, complete with the original Epson CGA monitor and the Epson Apex dot matrix printer. And uh, so yeah, there it was for students to use, but obviously nobody used it. For a couple of reasons. First of all, just nobody wanted to use it. It's a freaking, uh, at the time, 20-year-old computer that nobody would have even knew how to use, you know, running MS-DOS and stuff. But then second of all, um, sometime between 2008 and 2010 when I got this computer, the hard drive quit working in it. It had a 20 megabyte MFM hard drive on a card, not original to the machine, it was upgraded with that. Um, and I remember when the first time I ever used this computer, when it was still set up in that classroom, it started up and booted just fine. But then later, uh, between 2008 and, two, and 2010, uh, it stopped booting. The hard drive stopped working. And it was, I believe, in 2010 when my high school math teacher, who obviously knew that I was really interested in this computer, he offered it to me and I said heck yeah and took it. Now sadly, I didn't take the monitor or the printer because uh, I I don't think I could. I, I think I was told that I could only take the computer itself. I didn't have the room for the monitor and the printer. So I took just the computer itself, which I regret now, um, although I'm not at a loss now anyway because this thing originally had CGA graphics and I've since upgraded that. I took the computer home. Um, I discovered that the hard drive would not start when it's cold, but if you turn the computer on, let it sit for half an hour until it gets warm inside, turn it off and turn it back on, then the hard drive will start up and it'll work. But, you know, once the computer's turned off for even just a few minutes, once you turn it back on, the hard drive's right back to square one. It won't start up um, until you let it warm up again for another 10, 15, 20 minutes. But yeah, that's pretty much the story of how I got this thing. Uh, when I got it in 2010, um, it sat for 99% of the time for the next several years. Actually, the next 
seven or eight years, I guess, um, because it was just frustrating to use without a fully functional hard drive. The other thing is, is that, of course, because I didn't have the CGA monitor, and I've never owned any CGA monitor, I swapped the CGA card out. I still have the card all these years later. I swapped the CGA card out later for a uh, VGA card, a Trident TVGA 8900CL, which worked, but most of the time you turn the computer on, the card would start up in black and white for some reason, and everything would be in black and white. So then what you had to do was turn the computer off and on and off and on until it randomly decided to initialize with a color image. I have no idea what's going on with that. I still have the card. I'll probably never put it in any computer because I tried it in other computers and it does the exact same thing, so I don't know what's going on there. So yeah, this computer sat, mostly sat, for seven or eight years after I got it, between having no hard drive and a really sketchy VGA card, and I just never touched it. Well, all that changed um, a couple of years ago when I, dis when I learned about the XT IDE card. It's an 8-bit ISA card for XT-compatible computers that lets you use a modern IDE hard drive, or more popularly, a compact flash card as the hard drive. Um, so you don't have to, you know, find a working vintage MFM hard drive for one of these. You just buy an XTIDE card. You can buy the ki unassembled kit for 30 bucks, which is what I did, and then assemble it a couple of hours of your time with a soldering iron. Put it in this thing. It works just fine. And I've got a modern, well, in my case, a semi-modern three and a half inch IDE hard drive in this nice removable enclosure now and uh, it works just fine. So starting then, that was when I finally started um, using this computer a lot more. And then besides that, I also procured a Seng ET4000AX VGA video card, which I put in this thing, and that solved my video issues. A perfectly reliable VGA, actually an SVGA video card that doesn't have any of the glitches that the Trident card I had in this had. And uh, yeah, uh, since then, I've been using this computer quite often. It's such a fun computer to use, and now I've worked out, now that I've worked out all the issues it has, it's a fantastic computer to use. It's so fun, very rewarding. I don't have any problems with this thing. It, it just always works perfect. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, as brief of, uh, as I can get it. My history of this computer, how I got it, um, and what I've done to it to uh, be able to make it a, as good of a computer as it is now. Now in the last video I made of this computer, I showed that I still have the original Epson MS-DOS 3.2 and GW Basic discs for this thing, five and a quarter inch discs, which is pretty cool. But I didn't get to show you the manuals that I got with this computer, and here they are. Uh, these are the original MS-DOS 3.2 and GW Basic 3.2 manuals for the Epson Apex Plus and Apex Plus 20. That is pretty darn cool. They're in great shape. I don't think they've been, uh, they've been uh, adulterated upon in any way. And it's great, and uh, of course, I don't need the MS-DOS manual. I'm pretty much an expert at MS-DOS. But I'm definitely a novice at GW Basic and Basic in general. So once in a while I crack this thing open, read a few pages, and because I've always wanted to learn a bit more uh, uh, GW Basic or uh, probably more useful Q Basic. But yeah, uh, I didn't get to show those last time, so here's the... Uh, the original books I have for this thing, so that's pretty cool. So the sound card is one of the major recent upgrades I've done to this thing, um, but there is one more. It's actually not an upgrade, but it's a repair that I've done to this computer uh, after nine years. I uh, re finally replaced the clock battery in this thing. When I first got this computer in 2010, I removed the original clock battery, which was a rechargeable NICAD battery, just a little little uh, 3.6 volt NICAD battery soldered on the motherboard and it was starting to leak as these use as those NICAD batteries usually do in computers like this and I recommend anybody with a computer with one of those batteries remove it I removed it when I first got this computer and just I, although I always wanted to replace it I just left it first of all cuz at the time I didn't know how to solder yet 
and also the computer worked just fine without it. It's, it just wouldn't remember the time and date. So every time you turn the computer on, I had to enter the time and date into MS-DOS. Well, finally, recently, just a couple of days ago, before a couple of days before filming this video, I finally uh, devised a solution for the missing clock battery, installed it, and it worked perfectly. So this thing now has a functioning uh, real-time clock calendar. It keeps the time and date. Uh, even when it's turned off, it's uh, the clock calendar is running right now as the computer sits here. So uh, yeah, finally solved that, and I'll show you what I did when we open this thing up, which I'll do right now. So uh, give me a minute. I'm going to unscrew this thing, open the cover. We'll take a look inside. I'll show you my solution for the clock battery, and I'll show you the sound card that I put in this. So we're inside the computer now, and uh, you won't be able to see this very well because it's really tucked in under there. Uh, yeah, you might be able to see it all right, but there is my solution for the clock battery. That is a four cell AA battery holder, only three cells in use. So three AA batteries, and that holder has wires that go across, and it is soldered. You're not gonna be able to see it with all the cables and stuff in the way. But it just goes back and it's soldered to uh, where the original NICAD battery used to be. And yeah, it works perfect. The original battery, 3-cell NICAD, that's a nominal voltage of 3.6 volts, a fully charged voltage of 4.5 volts. So uh, three ordinary primary AA batteries, that's a nominal voltage of 4.5 volts, so no problem there. And uh, because you just need three cells and I used a 4-cell holder, I just got a... Uh, I just had to solder a jumper wire across the fourth cell. But there's something else I had to do too. Um, the original battery was rechargeable, but the batteries I've put in the holder there are not rechargeable. So what I had to do was install a diode. Um, this is a well-documented um, procedure, but when you replace a rechargeable clock battery with non-rechargeable batteries, you obviously have to install a diode so that charge current doesn't feed into the batteries and attempt to charge non-rechargeable batteries. That wouldn't be very good. So what I actually did was, and I'll show you a photograph I took of the battery holder before I installed it in the computer. You can see that the jumper wire in the fourth cell position is not just a wire, but it, I actually chose it as a convenient place to put a diode. That's a 1N4007 diode, just an ordinary silicon diode. 1N4007 is a really overbuilt diode for this purpose. It has a reverse breakdown voltage of 1000 volts. Um, but it's just what I had on hand. I, I desoldered it from a, a dead CFL ballast. But yeah, uh, an ordinary diode from a, from the 1N4000 series, like a 1N4001, which is the, uh, the most pedestrian one with a 50 volt uh, reverse breakdown voltage, that would work just fine. Um, but yeah, I chose that fourth cell position to put the uh, diode there to, so it doesn't try to charge the batteries. Now, of course, you could put NICAD or nickel metal hydride batteries in there and not have to use a diode, but the thing is, AA batteries and even AAA batteries, um, which is a more appropriate choice, AAA batteries, a AA holder was just what I had on hand. But even AAA batteries, the capacity is so high compared to the original tiny battery that was soldered to the motherboard that the charge current provided by the motherboard is never going to be able to keep them charged. Uh, you could run the computer all day. The self-discharge of NICAD or nickel metal hydride AAA or AA batteries is going to be way too overwhelming for the computer to be able to keep them charged. So they're just going to slowly discharge over time. This is my assumption anyway, I should say. Uh, this isn't something I know. This is something I would assume um, just based on what I, what I know and what I glean. But yeah, my guess would be that if you tried to use rechargeable AAAs or AA's, they're just going to end up dying. So might as well just use primary cells and put a diode in. Um, and on the other hand, because AA's are so huge compared to the original tiny NICAD battery, uh, I don't know how long I should expect it to last, but I wouldn't be surprised if it lasts years before I have to change those batteries again. And because of that, I haven't installed 
alkaline batteries, I've installed carbon zinc batteries. Carbon zinc batteries are less prone to leaking than alkalines. Although the only alkalines I've ever seen leak are Duracells. Uh, every other brand of alkaline I've never observed leaking, just Duracells. But carbon zincs um, are less known to leak in general, and when they do leak, uh, it's not as uh, it's not as horrible of a mess as it is for alkalines. And even better, lithium uh, primary batteries aren't known to leak at all, as far as I know. So lithiums, although they're quite expensive, might be the best choice for an application like this. But at any rate, I've installed carbon zincs, and I wouldn't be surprised if they last for years. Hopefully they do. That would be nice. And uh, the... Um, I actually put the holder, you might be able to see under the holder a bit of white there. That's a Velcro, a Velcro pad there. So uh, I actually have it attached via Velcro with the hopes that maybe whenever I have to change the batteries, I won't have to remove the drives. I can just stick my finger or something in there. Yeah, I can reach. You can hear me prying it up there and just rip it from the Velcro and bring it here. The wires are playing long and change the batteries. Getting this soldered was quite an ordeal. It, it took me the better part of an afternoon and an evening because I had to completely disassemble this computer, which I've never done before. I've never, I've never totally disassembled this computer. I had to take the motherboard out um, so I could get access to the solder points. And to get the motherboard out, you obviously have to take the, the expansion cards out. You have to take the drives out. You have to take the power supply out. And then you have to remove this piece of frame that's attached to the case um, that the drive cage and the power supply are attached to. Um, and to do that, I had to learn a new skill, which is drilling out a screw. Because as it turns out, one of the screws, uh, this one right here, not my doing, it was someone else's doing. It was actually, it was cross-threaded, first of all, and the head was all chewed up and you couldn't turn it with a screwdriver. So I actually uh, learned how to drill out a screw and I did that successfully and actually I was able to preserve the holes so I didn't have to use a, a, a bigger screw. I, I could just get a screw of the same size and it screwed right in just fine. But yeah, I had to remove the motherboard and this actually gave me an opportunity to totally vacuum out the case, which I've never done. So I got a lot of dust out of the case, which is nice. And uh, I cleaned up a little bit of corrosion that I discovered the original NICAD battery had left. Luckily, there were no broken traces, so I didn't have to do any repairs there. I just had to clean up what was there and uh, yeah, everything uh, was just fine. So. There's my uh, replacement for the clock battery for this computer. Now, here's something that's a bigger deal than the new clock battery. Here's the sound card that I've installed. It's an ESS audio drive, ES1868F. This card was made in 1997 and it originally came out of a compact computer of some sort. I've had this card sitting in a parts box for 10 years or something like that because I had no idea what a gem of a card it is. Literally, this is like one of the very best sound cards that you could put in a vintage computer. Um, first of all, as I said earlier, this is a Sound Blaster Pro compatible card, which is just awesome because it means any game or other piece of software that's Sound Blaster aware is gonna work with this card as long as it has compatible, as long as that piece of software is compatible with the Sound Blaster or the Sound Blaster Pro, it's going to work with this card. As far as that software is concerned, this is a Sound Blaster Pro and that's great. The other thing is, you'll notice that this is a 16-bit ISA card. Well, it does work in an 8-bit ISA slot. Now, I was about to say that the 16-bit portion is only used uh, by the uh, CD-ROM header, but this card doesn't have a CD-ROM header, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, oftentimes sound cards have CD-ROM headers on them, um, and oftentimes they weren't uh, ATA PI compatible. They were one of the proprietary CD-ROM uh, standards, like Sony's or Panasonic's. And oftentimes those cards will work in an 8-bit ISA slot. The sound part will work, it's just the CD-ROM controller won't work. But this card doesn't have a header for a CD-ROM controller. Um, so that's interesting. But uh, regardless, it works perfectly um, in an 8-bit ISA slot. So I'm not sure what this is doing. Um, but it's not required for the card to work perfectly, which is great. 
Um, so yeah, ESS, ES1868F, and um, it's a great card, not only because it's Sound Blaster Pro compatible, but because it's a very high quality card in general. A YouTuber known as Phil's Computer Lab, who also runs a website of the same name, Phil's Computer Lab did a video about this card, and he demonstrated a bunch of games and other stuff um, on his computer that was equipped with an ES1868F, and yeah, it, it all works perfectly. And what's neat is, although this card does not have a Yamaha OPL3 chip on it, um, it does have an OPL3 clone built into the main IC here. So, although I don't know if I had to guess, it's probably a transistor level clone, so a hardware level clone of the OPL3, and it's built into the main chip. And as far as my ears are concerned, um, the OPL3 synthesizer clone that's on this thing sounds just like the real thing. It's a lovely sounding synthesizer. Um, so yeah, this thing, uh, you know, as far as my ears are concerned, sounds as good as a Sound Blaster Pro would sound. But in many ways, this card is even better than a Sound Blaster Pro because the output is so clean. Um, how I discovered this card and finally took it out of my parts bin to try it in a computer was um, I actually put it in one of my Socket 3 systems because I recently had to reformat the hard drive in one of my Socket 3 systems and, uh, you know, reinstall DOS and Windows and all the software that was on it. And that computer had a Sound Blaster Vibra 16 in it, which is a low-end, plug-and-play, Sound Blaster 16 compatible card. It works just fine. But after reformatting the hard drive, I couldn't get it to work properly. Uh, QEMM was was conflicting with the card for some reason, and I, I didn't know what was going on. Um, but yeah, everything would work fine, but once I installed QEMM, Windows wouldn't boot anymore, and if I uh, removed, if I disabled the sound card driver, Windows would then boot up. So I don't, there's some kind of conflict going on there. I don't know what, considering uh, it worked just perfectly before I had to reformat the hard drive. But I tried different things and couldn't get it to work, and I'd, I'd, you don't need QEMM. I certainly don't need it on that computer with 64 megs of RAM, but it's just something I like to have. So I'm like, well, screw it. I pulled this out of my parts box, and I thought, well, I'll give it a try. Maybe it's an okay card. I had never used it before. I'm not sure if I've even tested this card before. Well, when I saw Phil's Computer Lab's video on this card, that's when I learned that it was a Sound Blaster Pro compatible card and a really great card in general. But then I discovered something awesome. This card has a connector on it for an internal speaker. And, and uh, the uh, speaker that was already in that computer, which was connected to the motherboard to provide uh, PC beeps, um, that connector will plug right in here. And I discovered that uh, with this card, uh, thanks to this internal speaker header, you can get basically built-in sound. You don't have to hook up an external pair of speakers. All the system sounds from Windows and everything else uh, could come out through the internal speaker, which is friggin' great, because um, I didn't have that ability on the Sound Blaster Vibra 16. So that was awesome. And then yet another thing I learned was that this card sounds so much better than the Sound Blaster Vibra 16. The audio quality of this card puts the Viber 16 to shame. Literally, the output is so clean. The Viber 16, which again, it's just a low-end sound blaster, wasn't meant to be high quality. They were mostly used for OEMs and stuff like that. But the output is just so... There's a lot of hiss, a lot of static, a lot of background noise. The sound quality is not very good. This thing, the sound quality is excellent. It literally puts the Viber 16 to shame. So I'm like, holy crap, you know, I can't believe I've been using a Viber 16 and letting this gem of a card just sit in a parts box. So I installed this card in my Socket 3 machine. Well then, a few days later, I did some reading about this card and discovered that it'll work in an 8-bit ISA system. And so I tried it in this computer and indeed, it works. It works perfectly. So... As expensive as Sound Blasters are getting now, and AdLib cards as well, this thing is sort of a godsend because these are really common cards and really affordable to get. 
uh, they're starting to get not as affordable just because they're vintage, but they're way more affordable than an equivalent Sound Blaster is. So yeah, a really high quality Sound Blaster Pro compatible card that's affordable and super common because they were used in, in so many OEM computers. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I never discovered this before. Um, this is perhaps, in my opinion, one of the greatest sound cards you can get for a vintage computer. Because it's got drivers for DOS, uh, Windows 3.1, Windows 95, Windows NT. It's got drivers for everything and they're hosted on the Phil's Computer Lab website. And it just works. You know, you install the driver, you set the usual parameters for the address and DMA and stuff like that. And uh, it just works perfectly. And any all the Sound Blaster Pro aware software that I've tried so far, it, it all works perfectly with this card. I even installed the official Sound Blaster Pro software that Creative Labs distributed with the Sound Blaster Pro card, and it all works perfectly. You install the software, you run it, and it's like, yep, you have a Sound Blaster Pro, and it all works perfectly with this card. So that is just super great. So because this card now lives in this computer, and I don't have one for uh, my Socket 3 machine, I went on eBay and ordered another one. And so uh, I have another one of these, identical card, same card, compact card, um, that's uh, in the mail, uh, going to be in the mail really soon, and that'll go in my Socket 3 machine. And uh, heck, if I ever need another sound card for another computer, I'll just keep buying these ESS cards. Um, for the record, it's not only the ES1868F that's, you know... Uh, great for this stuff and works in XT class computers and stuff. There's two other cards that I know of, the 1688 and the 1888. They are also cards that are just as good as the 168 or the 1868 and they work in an 8-bit ISA slot and they're Sound Blaster Pro compatible. Now, I specifically bought another one of these Compaq cards because what's really nice about them is they have a hardware volume wheel. And I would assume that's because of the internal speaker connector. So other other of these ESS cards, they don't have the hardware volume wheel. And although I didn't check, I would assume that's because they don't have the internal speaker connector. Which I love. I love the internal speaker connector. But yeah, there's a little tidbit for you. I would 100% recommend this particular sound card for anything from an XT to a Socket 7 or even newer. You just can't go wrong with one of these, it's a great card. With the sound card reinstalled, you can see here is a speaker that I uh, installed here and connected to the internal speaker connector. So I now have internal sound on this computer. Uh, I've, I've preserved the uh, speaker this down there for the PC beeps and now I have this one for the sound card output. So. Uh, I like the convenience. Obviously, the sound quality isn't as high than if you use headphones or external speakers, but uh, the convenience can't be beat. You know, I, I love the convenience of just only being only having to reach around, turn the volume wheel, and I don't have to hook up an external set of speakers that'll take up more space and stuff like that. So, yeah, I actually stole this speaker out of that Socket 3 system. Um, once I get the other one of these cards for that computer, I'll put another speaker in it. I've got a couple other speakers that are way bigger, so louder and better sound quality that I'll fit into that computer eventually. But I installed this speaker the best way I know how, uh, the zip ties, so that uh, fits just fine. And yeah, it gets plenty loud and it sounds just fine. It's a 8 ohm half watt speaker which is actually slightly undersized. This card is a really nice amplifier on it. It gets loud. And when you crank it up high enough, that speaker starts distorting a bit. Um, it's really, really impressive uh, internal sound output on this card. So while I'm here, I'll show you. There's the Seng ET4000AX SVGA card. There's the XTIDE card, which I bought as a kit and assembled myself. Uh, this is what the original MFM hard card was attached to. I just have it in here to fill the blank in the case. I still have the original Western Digital MFM controller and the original 20 megabyte Kyocera MFM drive, even though that drive's not really useful. I currently have that installed in the IBM portable PC. 
um, but just because of the inconvenience of the drive not working well anymore and also 20 megabytes is kind of small, eventually I'm going to buy another XT-IDE uh, so I can put that in the IBM portable PC and uh, have modern, reliable, large storage in that computer too. Speaking of hard drives, here's the hard drive I have in this thing. It's a Seagate ST3144A, 130 megabyte IDE hard drive from 1993. And this floppy drive is a 3.5 inch 720k floppy drive. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So let me put this thing back together. We'll set it up over there and uh, let's get to demonstrating some software. Alright, so we're all set up here, just about ready to go. Uh, for our peripherals, I have this Acer 6011 AT keyboard, which is XT compatible. Wide Alp switches, very nice. I have this Microsoft serial mouse. And for a monitor, this IBM LCD 1024 by 768 monitor, which I know is a really gross choice of monitor for a computer like this, but unfortunately my Sony Trinitron is currently in storage. Not sure when I'm going to be able to get that out. Um, before I turn it on, I should mention uh, the other specifications of this machine. Uh, this computer is powered by an NEC V20 processor running at 10 megahertz. That's an Intel 8186 compatible CPU. So it's like a 286, but just without the protected memory mode. And what's nice about that is a lot of software that claims to need a 286 um, doesn't use the protected memory mode. So it'll run on a computer like this fitted with an NEC V20. So that's pretty cool. Um, it, it also gives you a little bit of a speed boost over a standard 8088, like 5 or 10% speed boost. So uh, that's, what this, that's what's in this computer. Um, that was an upgrade I put in, uh, replacing the original Fujitsu 8088. I've also installed an Intel 8087 math coprocessor. Uh, this computer has the full 640K of RAM upgraded from the original 512K. That upgrade was done around 1989, as far as I know. So let's turn the light out and turn the computer on. And of course, uh, 10 megahertz is the uh, turbo mode, which I have a program that runs upon boot to automatically set it to 10 megahertz. The default is 5 megahertz for IBM PC compatibility. So that's the boot ROM messages for the video card. Now it's just counting up the RAM. There's the XTIDE, detects the hard drive, begins booting. There it set the CPU speed to 9.54 megahertz exactly. That is the ESS uh, audio drive sound card drivers. And up here, here's some Sound Blaster specific stuff that was set by the Sound Blaster software when I installed that. The uh, Microsoft mouse driver for the serial mouse. And in the previous video I made of this computer, I talked about how um, because this computer technically doesn't support 3.5 inch 720k floppy drives, it only supports standard 5.25 inch 360k floppy drives, um, this computer will work with a 720k drive, but you can't format the disk. When you try to format, the floppy controller doesn't know what to do because, you know, format is a lower level command and the floppy controller doesn't know how to format a 720k disk, so it just formats it as a 360k disk. In the last video I uh, made of this computer, I was using driver.sys, which is a file that comes with MS-DOS, and driver.sys basically allows you to map the floppy drive to another drive letter, so the floppy drive has two drive letters. Uh, one drive letter stays as normal, but the other drive letter, the new one, goes through driver.sys, and it allows you to format a 720k disk uh, using driver.sys. So if this is drive A, which it is, and I needed to format a 720k floppy, uh, driver.sys would map this at a second letter, letter D, let's say, and whenever I had to format a floppy disk, I would just say format D instead of format A, because format D sends it through driver.sys, which does all the needed higher level stuff to 
basically teach the floppy controller how to format a 720k disc. Well, V Westlife had told me about an easier, a better way of doing this, and it's this program right here, Set BPB35, and it's basically a TSR that that does all the work of driver.sys, but it does it uh, with the same drive letter, so you don't have to have a second drive letter. So once you run Set BPB35, um, it the, the floppy drive just works perfectly. You want to format a disk, it just does it, no problem. So yeah. Um, Really uh, glad for him for uh, for telling me that it's a really nice program for a computer like this. All right, so I've actually mounted my phone on a on a mount here, so I don't have to be shaking around trying to do everything with one hand. So the first thing I'll demonstrate, I'll just briefly demonstrate the Tetris game that I originally showed um, on the video of the Epson Action Note for SLC33. Just briefly here, just to show you what it looks like in color, since that laptop has a, uh, has a, uh, oh, that's not very good, has a black and white display, and I can actually use the numpad here, so that actually works. So. I'm very good at Tetris, but obviously I didn't get a good start here. Also, this game is quite difficult when you put the garbage uh, as high as it'll as it'll go. So it's kind of uh, kind of impressive. I notice the yes, the uh, image stabilization is getting confused by my hand there. So I'll uh, turn that off. So yeah, that's just a brief look at that. The next thing I'll show is uh, just today actually I installed Microsoft Works. Now I was hoping I could install Microsoft Works for Windows but the first version of Microsoft Works for Windows which is 2.0 it needs uh, at least a 286 um, so I wasn't able to uh, install that but I have the last version of Works for DOS installed here 3.0 from 1992 I believe and apparently my monitor has crashed, which it often does on DOS machines, so I just have to power cycle it here. So, Microsoft Works 3.0, you can see we do have a functional mouse. Uh, like the later versions of Microsoft Word for DOS, uh, you can run works in either text or graphics mode. I've chosen graphics mode here. It's slower on a computer of this caliber, but it looks a lot nicer. But yeah, Microsoft Works, you know, it's basically a cut-down office. Um, it's it's all integrated. You've got an in integrated word processor, spreadsheet, database, and a communications thing, which I assume would be a terminal emulator, which I didn't actually know Works had. Uh, oh, that's neat. I'll have to test this uh, on my own sometime and see how it works for BBSs. I can't imagine it works very well, but... Now I believe with Works you can install multiple windows and yeah, you can move windows around and resize them. So it's actually it's actually kind of neat. I can't seem Oh yeah, you can move them sideways. So yeah, it's kind of cool. You can have multiple windows open within uh, Microsoft Works. I'll open uh or not open actually. I'll create a new uh, word processor document. Unfortunately, Works doesn't seem to come with example documents that you can try things out with. I'm going to turn my brightness up just a little bit here. So here's a blank word processor. Word processor. And what's kind of neat is um, it does come with some example pictures that you can put in. And in the print preview mode, you can actually see those pictures. So if I go to insert picture, and you can other you can also insert other uh, Microsoft Works um, elements like charts that you've made in the spreadsheet program. Oh, I got to go into the Works directory here. And uh, we'll open butterfly.pcx, which is a picture. Um, so there it is. In the normal mode, it just gives you a placeholder. But if you go to the print preview mode through the print menu, you can actually view a preview of it and you can see the actual image. 
Now unfortunately, unlike Microsoft Word 6.0, uh, Work 3.0 doesn't let you zoom in on the preview. You only get this full page view which only takes up half the screen. So you can see, um, there's our butterfly. It's very small, but it is in color. Um, and actually, since it's a .pcx, the MS Paint program in Windows 3.0 may actually be able to open that. I'll actually have to try that later. So that's a little look at, uh, at Microsoft Works. I'll, uh, I'll make a, I'll make, I'll see if I can make a quick spreadsheet here. So you can now see we've got, uh, multiple windows open here and you can see things from other windows and you can click to switch from one to the next and we go to window go back to our chart or our sheet rather and I will maximize that so I'll just put in some data here um, uh, one oh, how do you go to the next cell to, can you actually not press, oh, the arrow keys work, all right. Three, four, and go 10, oops. Three, four, 10, two, 17, or just seven, I guess. Um, and let's see, I've never, this is actually the first time I've ever used Microsoft Works for DOS, so I'm actually learning as I go along here. So I want to make a chart of this data. Actually, I assume I should select the data first. New chart. And it's loading something from the hard drive. Oh, okay. It didn't give me the option to choose what kind of chart, but there you can see it created a bar chart. You get a nice full screen graphical view here, so that's quite nice. Can I get a pie chart though? That's actually what popped into my mind. Wouldn't be in settings, I wouldn't think. Notice the, uh, I, I call it VGA snow. Notice when I move my mouse around, you see little glitches sometimes. CGA snow is a, is a famous, um, glitch on IBM color graphics adapters um, where uh, as it draws elements uh, sort of this uh, uh, staticky garbage briefly shows up on the screen but I've never seen VGA snow which is what I often get on this computer in a lot of software I don't know if that's something to do with the Sang ET 4000 AX I don't know but it's kind of funny um, ah here we go pie New chart. What the heck? Pie. Ah, there we go. So it, it uh, changes an existing chart. So you have to click what kind of chart you want and then choose the existing chart. All new charts. I guess default to the bar graph. But yeah, there's the uh there's our little graphical multicolor pie chart. Very nice. So that's Microsoft Works on this 10 megahertz NEC V20 powered machine. So we'll get out of that. And it's gonna ask me if I want to save all this stuff. Nope. Nope. There. So the next thing I'll show is, now I thought it was pretty cool when I demonstrated uh, being able to view JPEG images in DOS on uh, the Epson Action Note. Or actually I demonstrated a couple of Windows 3.1 programs that could do it. But then I showed a DOS program which not only I find quite interesting but also the DOS program seemed to reproduce the image at higher quality than the two Windows programs. So I tried to see if the same DOS program would work on this computer. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It needs a 386. But Bananacom, which is a terminal emulator that I highly recommend and um, have installed on quite a few of my computers for browsing BBSs, that has the capability of showing uh, JPEG images, given that the image isn't too large in size, 
Um, but I, I, I was able to uh, put a picture, a photograph of myself on this that Bananacom is able to view. So we'll start Bananacom here. So I have an image, uh, an image of myself that's like 10 kilobytes in size. It's like a couple, of, a couple hundred picture, uh, pixels in each direction. And Bananacom is able to view it. So let's see how a 10 megahertz XT system renders a uh, 200 by 200 pixel approximately JPEG image. Once again, I've got to turn my exposure down here. So here I come. This is rendering in uh, VGA mode 13. So it's 320 by 200 with 256 colors. And it's rendering it surprisingly fast uh, for, you know, the kind of machine we're working with. And it'll beep when it's done. Yep, it beeped. So there you go. There's a picture of myself. I recently dyed my hair navy blue, which I really love. This is the profile picture for my Facebook page, The Maritime Girl, which I invite uh, you to follow if you want, where I post updates to uh, the channel and all sorts of other stuff. But yeah, there's a very low resolution JPEG photograph being displayed on uh, an XT machine from 1988, so that's pretty sweet. So there's that. So the next thing I'll show is, this is something else that I just installed very recently. Uh, I installed AutoCAD on this. And I was surprised, to say the least, when I discovered that AutoCAD Release 10 will run on this computer. AutoCAD Release 10 is from 1988. Because um, I figured AutoCAD uh, version 2.62, which is technically called Release 7 or 8, I think, I figured that would be the latest that could run on this computer, but no, AutoCAD Release 10 will. Um, which is quite impressive. It probably needs a 286, but doesn't use the uh, protected mode, so it's able to run on this computer. So I don't know how to use an older version of AutoCAD. I've used uh, one of the latest versions of AutoCAD um, in a power systems course I took in school. We used AutoCAD, not for a 3D, one of those fancy 3D drawings, but we used AutoCAD to make a 2D single line diagram, uh, basically a diagram of power transmission lines and stuff like that. So I've used modern AutoCAD for that, but I have no idea how to use an older version of AutoCAD. But I know just enough to load a cool wireframe drawing of the space shuttle, Columbia in particular. This is an example file that comes with uh, uh, AutoCAD 2.62. It didn't come with Release 10, but Release 10 can open uh, files from AutoCAD 2.62 apparently. So there it is drawing away, and by the way, this not only is aware, but it needs a math coprocessor. Which I find kind of weird, you know, I... because this program, that means since it needs a math coprocessor, this won't run, for example, on the Action Note, even though the Action Note is a 33 megahertz 486 SLC, um, and this is a 10 megahertz NEC V20, um, but it, it'll run on this computer, but not on that one. So I personally find it hard to believe that a 33 megahertz 486 SLC would be any slower at this than a 10 megahertz V20, but um, I, I don't know, but there it is. There's our uh, very nice, colorful uh, wireframe drawing of uh, of Columbia, and uh, I don't I don't know how to manipulate this. I don't know how to rotate it or zoom or anything. I know nothing about this. You get a bunch of these options at the side. I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, I'm just gonna type quit. Yes, and that sends us back to the main menu where I will exit. So that's pretty much all the non-sound related 
software I wanted to show on this. Now we're going to get to the really cool stuff. I'm going to demonstrate all the audio software that this computer can run, make use of that ESS Sound Blaster Pro compatible sound card, and that's what I'm pretty excited to, uh, to show in this video. So what you just saw there was the original Sound Blaster Pro demo uh, that Creative Labs shipped um, as part of the drivers and stuff when you bought a Sound Blaster Pro. So you can see it works just fine on this computer with that sound card and that ESS sound card with the clone OPL3 synthesizer. Really lovely sounding synthesizer and as far as my ears are concerned it sounds identical to the real thing so that's cool. Um, I'll open up a mod player that I have installed here. Um, and I just have one mod file. Uh, actually, I think I gotta go to the GLX Play. And I'll, I'll turn the volume wheel on the back here so you can uh, hear it's loading the file right now. There you go. That's coming out of the internal speaker that I installed. The, uh... The animation here and the updating of the instruments playing here is really slow. This is really slow because of this, and I believe there's a way to turn this on, but I forget, or turn that off so that these play in real time, but I forget how to, uh, how to do that. But no matter, you can see it plays just fine, and, uh, because it's this, this program, Sound Blaster Pro Aware, uh, the Sound Blaster Pro had the capability of playing digitized audio in mono at up to 44.1 kilohertz or in stereo at up to 22 kilohertz. This is a stereo mod file you can see so we're mixing at 22 kilohertz. But yeah you can see that works just fine. This thing's great for playing mod files. Really uh really really neat. 
so I'll just get out of this here. So this next piece of software I'm going to show is a game, and one that I've actually been playing a lot since I installed it on this computer. I've been finding it really fun. Uh, it's, it's a Commander Keen game. It's the second Commander Keen game, uh, Commander Keen in Goodbye Galaxy. I briefly demonstrated the first uh, Commander Keen game um, on the action note. Um, just to show how it ran, and it really wasn't suitable for that computer because of the passive matrix display and, and uh, you know, which sort of makes motion kind of hard to look at. But it also runs fine on this computer, and the second game, which I'm going to demonstrate here, also works fine on this computer, and the second game has sound and music in it, and it's sound blaster aware, so it works just fine on this computer. Um, the directory's called Keen 4 for some reason, I guess because the first episode of Goodbye Galaxy is the fourth Commander Keen episode, but the first episode of the second game, I don't know, it's confusing. But uh, we'll open Commander Keen here, and uh, I'll actually give you a partial direct feed of the sound and music. It's, it's really nice, it's a really nice game, you know, it's a fun game in general. But it's a really nice game too. The graphics are really nice and the sound and music are really nice. I believe it's all synthesized. All, obviously all the music is synthesized, but I believe all the sound effects are synthesized too. There's no PCM audio in this. It's all, it's all uh, synthesized. But uh, So I've been playing it a lot. I, I think I'm quite a ways through uh, the episode here. But I'll start a new game and just uh, show, briefly show you the first level. But yeah, the graphics and sound are really nice, really colorful game, really cute game. And all the enemies are so cute. That's part of why I love this game so much. All the enemies are adorable. Um, one of the enemies, which is the first one you'll see here, doesn't even hurt you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll briefly go the uh, through the first level here. I don't know if I'll finish it or not. Levels are a little slow to load, but uh, look at this guy. How cute is he? He doesn't even hurt you. He just knocks you around. There's a little bit of slowdown sometimes when there's a lot of action going on on the screen, but for the most part it runs just fine on this computer. And it's a very challenging game, despite its cute looks. It's a very challenging game. It's, it's quite hard. So I'm just gonna shoot this guy. There's one of the other enemies. But yeah, really nice sound and music in this. Oh, and there's the end of the level. I'll grab these. So yeah, there you go. And uh, it's a really fun game. I um, I generally don't game on my vintage computers, but I'm really glad I took the time to discover this one because it's just so fun. Like I said, I think I'm most of the way through playing this now, but uh. Yeah, there's Commander Keen uh, in Goodbye Galaxy running on a 10 MHz XT with a Sound Blaster Pro compatible sound card. Very nice. So this next piece of software I'm going to show you, which is the last piece of DOS software I'll demonstrate in this video, it's a pretty cool one. It's a sound playback and recording program and uh, it's called Voice Edit 2 and it came with the Sound Blaster Pro software that you got when you bought a Sound Blaster Pro. So the Sound Blaster Pro, uh, as does this ESS card in this computer, has a microphone input and it has a line input. So you can use this program to record from either input and it is a very well-featured 
playback and recording program. So I'll demonstrate it to you. So when we go in the SB Pro directory here, it's vEdit2. And there it is, Sound Blaster Pro Voice Editor version 2.07 from 1991. Very cool. So, um, what I have here is I have a vintage microphone connected to the microphone uh, uh, input on this card. So what I'll first demonstrate is uh, recording my own voice and playing it back again on a 10 megahertz XT which is pretty sweet. So the first thing you do is you have to set uh, you know you have to set all the parameters for your recording. What input is it coming in? Well in my case it's going to be the microphone. And kind of interesting, you can actually set a low pass filter or a high pass filter um, or no filter. So the Sound Blaster Pro had uh, digital filters um, incorporated into it. So artificial filters, um, I assume they were artificial anyway, that could filter out the low frequencies or high frequencies depending on what kind of recording you were making. I don't know if those fe if this particular set of features actually works on the ESS card because I personally haven't been able to find any difference in the uh, recording depending on what uh, filter you choose. But I'm just going to choose no filter here. And you can actually record, you know, you can do the usual and record a file to your hard disk, but you can actually record a file just to RAM. If, if you just want to do a really short recording or maybe a test recording, you can do it right to RAM, so you don't have to wait for, for your hard drive to load stuff when you want to play it back and, and stuff like that, so that's pretty neat. And uh, down at the bottom here, it tells you what the maximum length of the recording you can make is, depending on the settings you've chose. So here's your sampling rate, of course, it defaults to 8 kHz, that's, that's uh, analog telephone quality. Um, you can see if I change it to 11 kHz here, it goes down to 30 seconds, because of course you've got more data. And then uh, you've got 22 kHz. That's that's getting on pretty good, you know, acceptable quality for things like music. Um, and we're down to 15 seconds. And then you have 44.1 kHz. That's uh, compact disc audio uh, quality. And we can record 7 seconds of audio at 44.1 kHz uh, in 640 kilobytes of RAM. And of course, we can choose whether to record in mono or stereo. Now, the Sound Blaster Pro, it can record mono audio up to 44.1 kilohertz, but it can only record stereo audio up to 22.05 kilohertz. That was that was just one of the limitations of the card. So you can see, I actually can't select stereo until I choose one of the lower sampling rates. And with stereo, of course, your data rate's going to be doubled. So you can see when I, oh, that's interesting. Uh, Oh, can you only do stereo? Oh, is it because the microphone input is mono only? Yes, it is. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't notice that. So, uh, the microphone input, at least on the original Sound Blaster Pro, is only mono. So the program is smart enough not to let you choose stereo. It's just going to be a waste of space. You're not going to be able to make use of a stereo microphone. Um, but with the line in, you can choose stereo. And because the data rate it's going to be doubled because you have two audio channels the recording time is halved so we can record up to 22.05 kilohertz stereo sound now the ESS ES1868F is more capable natively than the Sound Blaster Pro the ESS ES1868F can record I believe up to 44.1 kilohertz in stereo but the Sound Blaster Pro wasn't capable of that. So was, when the card is running as a Sound Blaster Pro clone, as it's doing right now, you're only going to be limited to the uh, abilities of the original Sound Blaster Pro. So, um, let's make a recording here. I want microphone, no filter. We're obviously not going to be in stereo. Um, I'll, I'll do it to disc, and you can see we get a massive jump in... Uh, in uh, recording time because of that uh, big hard drive, relatively large hard drive I have in this thing. And I'm going to leave it on 22.050 kilohertz because unfortunately, um, well not unfortunately, it's just the nature of the thing. This computer is actually not powerful enough to record at the 44.1 kilohertz 
um, data rate, uh, sampling rate rather. Um, it just, you get a lot of skips and dropouts in the audio. The computer's just not powerful enough to process all the data at once, and it drops a bunch of samples at a time. Um, likewise, it cannot record 22.05 kilohertz in stereo. Um, so the best quality that this particular computer can record and not mess up the recording is 22.05 kilohertz mono or 11 kilohertz stereo, which 11 kilohertz stereo is not really that useful because you're going to have stereo, but the quality of the audio itself is going to be quite poor. Um, in my opinion, you're better off just recording in mono with 22.05 kilohertz if you're doing something like uh, recording music. So that's what I'm going to set. We're going to record to disk, and I'm going to click OK. And we haven't started recording yet, so I'm going to bring the microphone to my mouth now. And I'm going to say record to disk. And we get a uh, dialog box here. We have to set the name of the, uh, of the thing. So I'm going to call this test2. Oops, just test2. And uh, the file extension is going to be .voc, V-O-C, because that was Creative Labs' proprietary uh, waveform audio format, uh, uh, V-O-C for voice. And indeed, this software cannot play standard WAV files. However, it does come with some command line utilities that can convert a WAV file to V-O-C and vice versa. Um, the former is called wave2voc.exe and the other is voc2wave.exe. Um, I have not had good luck using those programs. They work fine for really short um, files, but I tried it on a file that was uh, two and a half minutes in length and the computer just froze before it converted it. So I find if you want to take, you know, something like a piece of music and uh, move it to this computer to play back on it. The best way I've found is to just open vEdit 2, um, hook, you know, hook your music player into the line in port and just do a recording of it rather than trying to transfer a WAV file to the computer and then convert it to a VOC. It just doesn't seem to work that well. Now there is one DOS program I found to play um, uh, waveform files and it works on an 8088 system and it's called, um, oh, I forget what it's called now. I think it's called SB Play, Sound Blaster Play. And I found it just didn't work very well because it, it was programmed in such a way that when it loads a file that's larger than the amount of RAM the computer has, it loads the first chunk of the file that fits in the RAM into RAM, plays through all of it, and then there's a pause in the playback while it loads the next chunk into RAM. So instead of just loading it bit by bit while it's playing, it, it plays one chunk and then there's a, the audio pauses for a few seconds while it loads the next chunk. So it's not suitable for, for music playback at all. V-Edit 2 doesn't have that issue. Um, so I am going to record a file called Test 2. And it's about to start. Okay, so now it's started. So. This is a microphone voice recording being done on the Epson Apex Plus into the uh, ESS1868F Sound Blaster Pro compatible sound card. 10 MHz NECV20, we're recording in 22.05 kHz mono. So I will click stop. And that's our file recorded. So I'll go to play from disk. And... I'll play test two. We'll see how it sounds. And there you go. That was a uh, voice recording made and played back on this computer. Pretty darn cool, just like a, a Tandy 1000. The later Tandy 1000s had the capability to record and play back uh, uh, waveform audio. So that's that I think is, is pretty darn cool to have that capability on a computer this old. Now there are actually editing functions to this program, that's why it's called Creative Voice Editor after all. However, I haven't really quite figured them out. 
Um, this program does have the capability of playing uh, CD audio. Of course, I don't have a CD player in this machine. Um, but if we go to File, we go Load, we'll do our test too. File size is too large, so um, it has uh, split the file into a bunch of different sections here called blocks. And because the sound file is obviously too large to load entirely into RAM, we have to um, choose what blocks we want to edit. So I'm just going to choose a random block here. Oh, actually, and it put it in automatically. It put 5.5. Five. So I'm just going to click OK, and we don't have to split it. Okay, not sure what Terminator means. Um, edit, modify. Ah, so now we get a waveform representation of the file. Pretty cool. And what's this sound like when we click play? Okay, what if I take this right here? Oh, there. So I've selected a chunk. Can I play just that chunk? Yes. Okay. Effect. Echo? Really? Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna... Can I select all? No, I can't. Uh, I, I want to try the echo effect on a good chunk of it. Uh, what's that? Okay, that's good enough. Effect echo? Percentage. Sure. So I imagine this... Oh, I was going to say this probably takes quite a bit of processing, but it didn't take too long. Oh, that's interesting. You know what? Can I undo? Is it possible to do that? No, but I assume I can quit without, uh, without saving any changes. So let's go back to Edit, Modify. And I actually want to take this whole block and add the echo effect. That's, that's quite interesting. Fade out. <laughs> this is quite cool. I haven't uh, I haven't played with this yet. You can edit the sampling rate. Right? That's kind of interesting. Well, that's good. There you go. So you get some very rudimentary um, editing functions. So there's the uh, Sound Blaster Pro Voice Editor version 2.07. And, uh, of course, uh, there are actually some command line tools that you can use to play and record um, sound. You don't have to go into the uh, uh, voice edit program itself. If you go into the directory uh, vedit2, so there's, there's uh, two... There's two programs uh, that you can do that with. vplay, that's a command line tool to play sound. And vrec, that's a command line utility to record sound. And if I do vrec, you can see there's all the switches you set to uh, set the sampling rate and all the other sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, it's a nice little tool. You can uh, make a recording straight from the command line. And uh, same thing for vplay too. You can play uh, a sound recording right from the uh, right from the command line, which is pretty cool. So before we end this video, I've got a couple of Windows programs to show. So we're going to start up Windows here, Windows 3.0, which runs okay on a computer like this. It's a little bit sluggish, but not too bad. Windows 2.11 would run a lot better, but of course Windows 1.0 and 2.0 were really primitive compared to Windows 3.0. I'm not a fan of the, the aesthetic style. Um, 
And of course Windows 3.0 is going to have a lot more software compatibility. Although a lot of Windows 3.0 software required at least a 286. But there are a few programs that will run on an 8088 or um, more likely on a V20. The first program I'm going to show you is a program that lets you play MIDI files on the sound card. Um, now, of course, Windows 3.0 does not have the Windows Sound System, which was the subset of Windows that let you play waveform audio through the sound card. That was introduced in Windows 3.1. Windows 3.0 doesn't have that. Um, so there's no software that I can run on this computer to play waveform audio, like a wave file, through the sound card. But MIDI is addressed differently than waveform audio is. Windows software on Windows 3.0 can still directly access the synthesizer uh, on the sound card. So we do have a program here. Turn up the exposure a bit here. Maybe not that much. There we go. So let's go in here. And there's actually a Windows directory. And yeah, we have a couple programs here. There's a setup program that's basically just used to set the, uh, the uh, Sound Blaster parameters just like it would be in DOS. So which sound card do you have? We have a Sound Blaster Pro. And you know, you just set the I.O. And, and that sort of stuff. So we don't need to do that, so I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, the SB Mixer, so we do have a volume control. I don't actually, I haven't actually tested to see if the Sound Blaster uh, mixer, the Sound Blaster volume control works on the ESS card. I would hazard a guess that it probably doesn't because uh, the ESS card, the audio drive driver that loads in the autoexec.bat, that has its own um, volume control program. So I would assume this doesn't work, but I don't know. Although interestingly, if I do this, testing, testing, so once it does something, uh, yeah, there you go. My voice actually registers on this gauge right here. Um, yeah, there it is. So my voice is actually being picked up here. So that actually works. Um, and again, you have this filter setting, which is kind of interesting. So, um... Let's get out of that, and then the interesting program of the three is the jukebox, which lets you play uh, MIDI audio. And it comes with a couple of sample MIDI files. So we'll actually go up a directory, or go up a level, rather, uh, MIDI. And yeah, we have four sample MIDI files here, so let's try this one. And we just, it loads it up in a play queue here, and we do play. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Kind of a neat uh, MIDI player. It's too bad there isn't a way. There isn't a way for to get Windows 3.0 to play waveform audio. 
Now there was a special version of Windows 3.0 called Windows 3.0 with multimedia extensions. It was sold only uh, with OEM computers, with very high-end computers that met uh, a standard called the Multimedia PC Standard, or uh, MMC. And it, it, was a, it was a specification, a standard of specifications for computers. Um, and if the computer met that specifications, it got a special label on the case, and it got the special version of Windows 3.0 with multimedia extensions, which did come, it did introduce the Windows sound system. And uh, you can run Windows 3.0 with multimedia extensions on standard IBM PC compatible computers, but uh, you need at least a 286. It's otherwise just a, 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 a standard Windows 3.0. Um, on the, you know underneath, but all the multimedia software that comes uh, with it, that all needs a 286 to run. All right, so the last program I'm going to show uh, for today's video is WinZip. So I actually uh, decided to go on a mission and see if I could find a version of WinZip early enough to run on an 8088 or NEC V20 machine running Windows 3.0, and I did. It's WinZip version 2.0 from 1991. Uh, second version of WinZip ever. And it runs on this computer, and it actually does work just fine. It works quite well. And what's kind of neat is, despite this version of WinZip being from 1991, um, so it's almost 30 years old, it actually works just fine for extracting and compressing modern archives because uh, early versions of WinZip, until WinZip 5.0, I think, um, were not standalone programs. Uh, early versions of WinZip were nothing more than shells for PKZip. Now, PKZip is a DOS program. PKZip is the original archive, the original, you know, basically the first popular archive compression and extraction utility. And it was the program that, uh, that the zip archive format originated from. So early versions of WinZip require PKZip to be installed first because whenever you do anything in WinZip, it has to call PKZip. And the computer will actually switch to the command line to run the appropriate PKZip command. And then when PKZip finishes, it switches back to Windows and you get the results of what PKZip did in WinZip. This is great because um, the very last version of PKZip for DOS, version 2.5 from 1999, runs just fine on this computer. And because it's such a late version of, of PKZip, it supports pretty much all the, you know, any modern zip archive that you find on the internet or whatever. Um, the last version of PKZip for DOS is going to deal with it just fine. And as such, this version of WinZip, despite being super old, it's not going to have any trouble dealing with modern zip archives because the underlying component is a far newer version of PKZip. So that's very cool. Um, so I'll demonstrate creating an archive here. So we'll, we'll click New for New Archive. You can see the user interface is far different from newer versions of WinZip. But the, all the basic functions are exactly the same. Those have never changed. That's quite cool. So I'm going to make an archive just in the root directory here. And I'm going to call it test3.zip. Because there's already a test1 and test2, I believe. Alright. So it's made our archive. And now we need to add files to it. So I'll click add. And a big add dialog box comes up. Or actually not. Well, it's big once you click this because it gets you to a file browser. Alright, so we want to add files. We're going to compress for speed rather than size. Um, let's choose that. Hold down the control key. We'll do those three files and uh, we'll do this as well. And we will add those files. And now it's going to switch to the command line where pkzip is going to do the work of adding those files. So you, there you can see, starting a, starting a command line session. Oh, and my monitor froze. That's convenient. There you can see. <laughs> you could briefly see that, this stupid LCD monitor. So 
So I'm going to do that again because you missed uh, you missed the uh, process there. I'll just choose all these files. There you go, you'll see the process this time. Stupid camera would focus. It's pretty quick, it, it doesn't take that long to, uh, to do on a 10 megahertz machine. I was actually kind of surprised. But there you go, that's a quick demonstration of, uh, of a very, very early version of WinZip running on this computer. And there, I didn't even notice this until I posted a picture of this on uh, Facebook and somebody else pointed this out. This is obviously not Y2K compatible because it says that the year is 118 and 119. So that's kind of hilarious. But uh, yeah, that's all the Windows programs I wanted to show. I actually tried Ski Free on this to see if Ski Free would run decently, but unfortunately Ski Free does not. It was very slow. It actually opens and plays, but it's extremely slow, not usable at all. So Ski Free, not for a 10 megahertz V20, unfortunately. But we'll get out of Windows here. Well, there's another video in general on this lovely computer, the Epson Apex Plus Turbo XT system from 1988. Uh, a look at some hardware uh, repairs and upgrades I've made to this computer. That awesome new sound card that I've put in and uh, demonstrating a bunch of software, some sound software that makes use of the sound card in this computer. A game that makes use of the synthesizer on the sound card. Um, and this computer is working just as great as ever, and uh, this computer just becomes more and more awesome as time goes on because of the upgrades I'm making to this. This is very much a pet project of mine to make a Super XT, just the highest end XT that you could possibly get. 640K of RAM, V20, 8087, SVGA video card, Sound Blaster Pro compatible sound card, a great big hard drive, a three and a half inch floppy drive. This is a Super XT class computer. And uh, I just, I couldn't be more happy with how this computer's turned out. And in the future, I'd like to do even more upgrades to this computer. First of all, I'd like to get an EMS board in this computer. I'd like to add EMS memory to this computer, like a megabyte or two megabytes of ES, uh, e EMS memory. I think that would be super awesome, because then I'd be able to run even more software on this computer that doesn't really run because 640K just isn't enough with the TSRs and other software I have installed. The other thing I might do in the future is add an Ethernet card to this thing because I think, I think I have an ISA Ethernet card that will work on this thing. It's an NE2000 compatible Ethernet card and from what I've read it will work in an XC class machine. I don't know what exactly I'd do with this thing with an Ethernet connection. Um, but if, if, you know, if I do the research and it turns out there's a few cool things I could do, I'll certainly consider adding an Ethernet card to this thing. But for now, this is definitely one of my favorite vintage computers ever. It just, it just, it, it, it always works. It, it hasn't broken down on me. And it's just so awesome. Such, you know, a, just a, a blasphemously uh, powerful XT machine. And I really love that. So thank you guys for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you in the next video.